So great to have with us Enrique Zimmerman, a good friend. He's a journalist extraordinaire. He was actually nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize because of uh, the diplomacy that he's been doing over the years. Um, and he serves today as the chairman of the Israel GCC Chamber of Commerce. This uh, helps build the business relationships between Israel and between the six Gulf countries, including Saudi Arabia. We had the pleasure of interviewing you, Enrique, at the Arise 2020 Digital Summit. That was uh, shortly after the signing of the Abraham Accords. Uh, and so excited to, get, to have you here today. Uh, we're looking forward to your update now that we're three years after. Let's start there. We're three years after the Abraham Accords. What does that look like today? What, what's been developing? Well, it's quite amazing, Caleb. I think we are in the, I would say, the fourth chapter of a book with at least 20 chapters. But things are happening so fast. It was, the agreements were signed uh, 22 months ago, really, but the process was quite long. There was a preparation of the public opinion for a decade, I believe. That's the big value of these agreements with the United Arab Emirates. They lead the Abraham Accords. They are the most advanced Arab country that we have relations with today. Then we have Bahrain, which is the gate of Saudi Arabia. That's the importance of Bahrain because they wouldn't, they never would sign an agreement with Israel without the approval of the, the crown prince of Riyadh of Saudi Arabia. They are really connected. And then we have Morocco. You know Morocco, it's internal policy in Israel because we have one and a half million Moroccans right. here, Jews coming from Morocco, and then Sudan. So it was great, it was amazing. We are developing relations. We have a free trade agreement with the United Arab Emirates. And I'll tell you something else. In 2024, we are going to have astronauts from the Emirates, a man and a woman, landing in the moon. And what do you think wow. they have in their hands at that moment? They intend to bring a flag, an Israeli flag, because Israel is helping them in the technological side of this so adventure. Now, I've been so. Is it fair to say that there is no longer an Arab-Israeli conflict? I mean, some people have said that, and I believe I was told that since the signing of the Abraham Accords, our trade with Jordan has grown by 3x, and as with Egypt as well, because now that there, it seems like there's no longer a conflict with these major players down in the Gulf, our immediate neighbors, so why shouldn't we do more business with Israel? Look, I, I would say... I wouldn't speak about a new Middle East. I would speak about a different Middle East. Okay. And I think we are in the middle of a very exciting process. A month and a half ago, I was in the French Senate, and there was a big event about the Abraham Accords. They wanted to know what's going on. They understood something is going on, and they felt completely outside, completely, I mean, not related with. And they wanted to understand, so I told them, Please, don't do like the Palestinians. Don't lose the train. Things are happening, and you're not there. So I suggest that you should join this train, because it's really exciting. The same thing I said in Catalonia, in Barcelona, in the parliament two weeks ago, after France. I think we're going to continue in different countries. I think it is vital that the world understands that this is the best thing that happened in the Middle East in the last decades. It's really a game changer. We have a chance of having peace with many Arab and Muslim countries in the next years. We have a chance of leaving a completely new reality to our children and to our grandchildren. So let's do it. That's amazing. Now what would you, as, as the chairman of the Israel GCC Chamber of Commerce, what are the main areas so far of, of business and industry? I mean, obviously, I think, there are 70 flights a month going back and forth from Israel to, to Dubai alone? 400. 400, okay. <laughs> so it keeps on growing. Every time I interview somebody, 400. And they are always full, okay. which is so, amazing. So obviously tourism and conferences, right? Which is important. That's a big boost to both economies. But besides that, areas of, of real business and industry, what, what do you see? Look, I see incredible things. Some of them, some of them can't be published yet, uh, not to kill them before they are born. But amazing things are happening. Look, this free trade agreement brought us in days from 500 million to $1 billion 
trade only with the UAE. Wow. Now, the expectation is that in the next five years, we are going to see $10 billion trade between us and the UAE. And we are not talking about Just Bahrain, about Morocco, about Sudan, and about Saudi Arabia, which is the big news this week with, well, at this time after the, the, the Biden's visit to the Middle East. Saudi Arabia is really the biggest chance because the moment there will be a kind of normalization with Saudi Arabia, even if it's only the beginning, the first phase, all the Muslim countries will see it as a green light to start officially having trade with Israel. So here we are three years after the Abraham Accords. As somebody who worked behind the scenes to build the Abraham Accords before they were signed, is it fair to say that today Israel and its relationship with Saudi Arabia is where Israel was with the UAE and Bahrain five or six years ago? Is it, as far as unofficial diplomatic relations and business relations and, and, and defense relations, etc.? No. I think we are much more advanced. Wow. Wow. I think we have, and it's not a secret because it's being, you know, a little bit uh, uh, leaked that our relation with Saudi Arabia is much deeper than it is reflected in the media mm -hmm. for a long time because of many reasons. I met an official from Saudi Arabia, very high official, very known. Uh, he was the, the head of the intelligence services in, in Saudi Arabia for 20 years, Prince Turki Al Faisal. And I met him in the United States many years ago, almost a decade ago. He invited me for a meeting, and it was the first time, Caleb, that I understood that we understand nothing, mm -hmm. that things are happening and we are not aware of, of this, that in a way the Arab world is changing the priorities. So he asked me many questions, and then he said, now your turn, ask me whatever you want. So I asked him my question that I brought from Israel, which was, what happened to you guys? I mean, your highness, I said, you, you came, you wanted to destroy Israel in the last century. That was the common platform of most of the Arab leaders. What happened to you that now you want a flirt with Israel? At that time, it was the beginning of the flirt. So he said, look, we have common enemies, we know, Iran, the world jihad groups, they threat you, they threat us in the same way, and we need to be protected. And you're going to see now this root of new NATO that is being created in the Middle East. Wow. You know, it's what not a secret. This, this meeting yeah. was, was in 2013, wow. first time. Wow. And since then, I think he changed my life because I, I understood the importance of opening doors, mainly in the Gulf, but not only in the Gulf, also in Northern Africa. And I started this work state, country by country. And I think we succeed. But then he said to me, there is something else. We want you to be not only the startup nation, but to be the startup region. We want to share with you, to help you, to develop the technologies that you have. You're amazing in the technological side, so let's do it together. And the most important thing was, he said then, and since I was in Saudi Arabia and in many countries, I understood he was right, 70% of the Saudi population are under 30. And for them, as you said before, the wars of the last century are like the Roman wars. Right, longer relevant. Past. Yeah. Passé. Yeah. So they're connected they, to social networks. They're, exactly. Yeah, yeah, they they're look, and you know what they dream about when I've been in Saudi Arabia? I met a group of youngsters, 50 youngsters, men and women, students, and I asked them, what is your dream? They said, to visit Tel Aviv. Wow. <laughs> That's the icon. Alam Asala. Exactly. <laughs> they want to come. They know Welcome. that Tel Aviv is yeah. like, they can enjoy in Tel Aviv, so for them, it's like a dream. They look at Tel Aviv like something. No, I think we are living a new world, but we can't forget that we have spoilers. We have here groups, proxies of Iran, that are all the time trying to destroy this dream. Right. So I think that was the reason of this new coalition, but 
they are still threatening it all the time. So we, so we uh, a lot of the people, most of the people who follow us are Christian business people, mostly evangelical Christian business people around mm -hmm. the world. Um, some of them are considering investing right now in Israeli Saudi projects uh, that uh, will build, for instance, uh, Neom. It's it's you know obviously the new smart city, which is which is maybe the most important thing on the agenda of MBS. He's trying to raise five hundred billion dollars uh, to to build this new city, with zero carbon emissions, uh, highly advanced technologically, and so on and so forth. So, how would you explain? Um, the importance of investing in Israeli Saudi Arabia projects for the diplomatic future and the security future of Israel. You know, most, most of our viewers are watching this because they support Israel and they see it as a miracle, a miracle of biblical significance and, and very important. Why would it be important for them to consider playing a part in this? Hey. First of all, because it's Israel. And I, you know, recently I've been saying in different parliaments in the world something that I believe deeply, that this country is the main achievement of humanity in the last century. And I thought that some members of the parliament would, you know, would scream and would say, what are you saying? What are you saying? No, some people even applaud when I said that, because I deeply believe we can prove it. I, I can tell you that things like, for instance, Hebrew, a language that was dead for 2,000 years, that was only religious, now it's something that we speak normally in the streets. That's a miracle. I mean, you can't, as Abba Ibn said once, in a country like Israel, if you don't believe in miracles, you're not realistic. Right. And, and, and that's exactly, we, it's really a miracle. But then, if you ask me why to invest here, because it's really a good business. Mm -hmm. I really believe, and I see it with my eyes when I visit the Arab countries, that this new relation between Israel and them is very, very smart. We have the know-how, and they have the finances, and I think we can do here really important things, but that's now or maybe never, yeah. because in two, three, four years, it will be a little bit late. Like I think it's... Or, or at least the profit margins will be a little bit less. Exactly. <laughs> now it's the right moment to yeah. do it and to start all this cooperation. I think it's going to be amazing in the economic point of view. And uh, not only in the economic, you know, you can ask, many people ask me, why peace with Egypt and Jordan is so polemic in those two countries? And when you go to the Emirates, to Bahrain or to Morocco, you see a support in the streets. Yeah. Because in these new countries of the Abraham Accords, there was a preparation of the public opinion yeah. through social media in the last decade. Every youngster heard good things about Israel. In Egypt and in Jordan, it never happened. It was before the social media, and the media was very hostile. And it was more a peace between elites, between governments, between businessmen, between armies. Today we have a telephone, a red telephone between Israel and, and Egypt, working 24 hours a day. But we don't have a really deep relation or tourism coming from the two countries or, or it, visiting. It also seems like those uh, former uh, peace agreements with the former countries were based on both countries not wanting war. But these peace agreements seem like they're based on economic interests. That, which is a, a, such a strong driver for you know a, a trade and and an economy. Um, it is, yeah. But so, it's more than that. One of the leaders last week that I met in in the in one of the Emirates, he said to me an incredible sentence. He said, "Please, Enrique, deliver to the public opinion in Israel a message. Our decision is a strategic decision." for the next 50, 70 years. We are thinking about some generations. We want to go on together with you, hand by hand, really, and, and to do things together. So... That's, that's amazing. In a way, it's, it's so important to hear your perspective and mm -hmm. to understand that people have been working on this over the last 10 years. You said you, you had the meeting with uh, the uh, UAE leader in 2013, right? Saudi. 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 Saudi, 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 Saudi. This is even more uh, yeah. interesting. In 2013, which is, yeah. which is almost 10 years ago. And so people who are jumping on the train right now, in a way, 
are coming in to, to pick the ripe fruits of something that, that's, that's taken place uh, over, over a decade. I'll, t I'll tell you something even more amazing that I never said. The first one of his family that I met was not him. I met his brother, uh, Saud al Faisal, who was the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia for 40 years. I was the moderator of a meeting of the UN uh, two years before 2011 in Qatar. And uh, I was the only Israeli on stage, and I gave a speech like an Israeli from Jerusalem with a message. At that time, it was like, wow. And Saud bin Faisal, who was very old already, the, the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia, came to me walking. You know, it was not easy for him to walk. He came to me and he said, Mr. Zimmerman, please deliver a message to your friends. Our airspace is open for you if you need it. Wow. Now, he was not talking about El Al. He was talking about an attack to Iran. So I told him, your highness, I'm not a pilot. <laughs> and he said to me, yes, 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 and he left. That was 2011. Wow. Two years afterwards, I met his brother, Turki El Faisal, the head of the intelligence. Recently, I met his son, Abdelaziz bin Turki El Faisal, who is the minister of sports in Saudi Arabia, very young and very close to MBS. And the conversation with him was really amazing. That's what I can tell you. That's amazing. That's amazing. Reminds me, you know, we, we talked about Israel being a miracle. And there is a, a scripture in Isaiah that says to Israel, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment will be condemned. It seems to me like all the weapons and the, and the naysaying of, of Iran against Israel and against it, it, these partners is only helping to solidify this relationship even more. And, uh, and in a way, it hasn't been bad for, as far as our peace between uh, our neighbors. But I so we should pay a salary to the supreme <laughs> leader in Iran? No, exactly. well, Maybe we do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. uh, but OK, I want, I want to jump into the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As the Israel-Arab conflict is disappearing, we still have an issue with the Palestinians. Now, I think you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but you may be the only Jewish-Israeli journalist that ever sat down with uh, Sheikh Yassin, the spiritual leader of Hamas, the, the, all the supreme leadership of Hamas in Gaza. You've been in very interesting places, did very interesting interviews. I really understand behind the scenes the thinking of, of Hamas and the... And the the Palestinian militant organizations. Is there a way for this new uh, peace and brotherhood with our other Arab neighbors to spill over into the Palestinian situation? Is, is there a way to, that you say, see to make movement on that issue? I mean, if I was a Palestinian, I would be, I would be well, upset, but at least very nervous right now that the Arab League is kind of saying, we're going to make peace with Israel regardless of, of the Palestinian conflict because it doesn't seem like that's being solved at a quick enough pace. What, how, how will this uh, play out in your opinion? Look, it's, it's the one trillion dollars question, but I'll tell you my opinion. I think that the Palestinians are really experts in losing opportunities. And here, they may lose a huge opportunity. Why? There is a problem with the Palestinians, some problems with the Palestinians. Very ob in a very objective way, as much as I can, I will tell you what are the problems. First, there is, a f I think, 30, 40 percent of the population support Hamas. And Hamas, I know, because I interviewed all the leaders, not only Yassin of Hamas till today, all of them, all of them, many times. Uh, and recently, I didn't interview, but I met Khalid Mashal in Qatar, and I spoke with them. There is a problem. The majority of Hamas, not all of them, the majority of the leadership, they still believe in the destruction of Israel. The difference between them and Daesh, the Islamic State, is not huge. They both believe in an Islamic State all over the area, in Israel, in Palestine. They don't accept a Palestinian state. Palestine by them is defined by the entire Israeli map, exactly. right? It's, so yeah. for them, they want to replace all this area with an Islamic state, not a Palestinian secular state, right. like, like Mahmoud Abbas wants. Now, that's one problem. So with whom are we going to do peace, to make peace? Are we going to do it with only one part of the Palestinians? Is it enough? 
And besides, there are two Palestines, not one. You have the one in the West Bank controlled by the Palestinian Authority, and you have the one in Gaza with Hamas. So with whom and are you going to negotiate? Some people say they hate each other more than they, each one hates Absolutely. us. Absolutely. <laughs> not. I know that. They really hate each other, yeah. deeply, because they represent two ways of living completely different. So they, they really, there is a hostility, there is a civil war, yeah. a That's passive true. civil the war between The vast majority of the, of, the, of the killings, of Absolutely. the arrests, of the, of the torture and degrading treatment, executions without trial, it's Hamas against PLO, PLO against Hamas. Israel's Ab not even involved in it. Yeah. Absolutely, the hatred is, is deep between them. So with whom do we deal? Number two or number three, we have a leadership problem. There is a gentleman that President Mahmoud Abbas, that I know very well, I used to, to eat with him lunch uh, every month for many years, and I met him since he was num the number two of Arafat, and I think he had good intentions, really. But today, he's an 86 years old man, ill, isolated. In COVID, he was completely alone because he was afraid. I mean, He's not accepted. His authority, democracy, was completely erased and destroyed in, in the Palestinian territories. There are no elections in the last 16 years there. So he has no legitimacy, really. So with whom are we going to deal? I mean, we must maybe pay a price for peace. But are you going to do it with someone who really is not a legitimate leader? of this authority, so we have some problems here that we need to solve. But if you ask me about the future, because things can change, I believe Einstein used to say that stupidity is trying the same method and expecting different results. Okay, we tried bilateral negotiations since Madrid conference. I was there in 91 with the Americans, with the Russians, with the UN, mainly Americans as mediators never happened. We never succeed. Why? Because the gap is too deep. The wounds are too deep. So the only way I see of bringing us to an agreement with the Palestinians, which is our interest as Israelis for the future, because we don't have borders, recognized borders, and we need to have them, the only way is with the help of the Arab countries, led by Egypt and Saudi Arabia, and together with the United Arab Emirates, Jordan, and Morocco. I believe this quintet can do something, can in the future have an influence on the Palestinians. And you know why? Because they are fed up. They want to, to at least reduce as much as they can the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians so they can develop this relation with Israel. And the Palestinians understand that, and now they are in panic. I think they are living very tough days because they understand they are losing the train and the Arab countries are going forward together with Israel. Very interesting. So, you know, I remember people saying 10 or 15 years ago, the big, greatest conflict in the world is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the Israeli-Arab conflict. And it's hard to find people saying things like that anymore. Uh, today, uh, what everybody likes to discuss is, is the new Cold War. What were, Russia, Russia coming into Ukraine, now expanding its presence in, in Syria, its relationships with Turkey, with Iran. How do you see Russia f fitting into the whole equation of the new, the new Middle East uh, and vis-a-vis um, -vis the Abraham Accords and, and Israel's relationship with its Arab neighbors? What, what, what is the effect that that conflict has on what we're seeing today? I think the Russians are a little bit in shock in everything related with the Middle East. Because, you know, the only presence they have in the Middle East is in two points in the Syrian geography, in Tartus and Latakia. They have uh, military bases there. And for 98 years, as a um, reward for their help to Assad, to save Assad. Assad was lost, the president of Syria. And because of the Russian, the Russian and Iranian help, he stayed in power, which was for, the, for him quite a miracle. Now, the Russians for a while in the last years cooperated with Israel. You could see officers of the Russian army eating hummus in the Golan Heights with Israeli officers. And that's how they closed their eyes when Israel attacked 
uh, pro-Iranian and Iranian uh, military militias in, in Syria. Suddenly we see a new situation. We see that Russia wants to fight for their old, ancient role when they were the USSR. They never accepted to become a second-line superpower. They see that in the modern world, they see the United States as the first, then they see China threatening the United States. In a way, they see the European Union with many crises, but still a superpower, and they are forget forgotten in, in a way, and they feel that what they are doing now is to fight for their pride, to fight for their role, and to say, gentlemen, don't forget something. We have the biggest nuclear arsenal in the world. We have 6,000 warheads, nuclear warheads. So you can't ignore us. You must take us into account. And by the way, Vladimir Putin already said it in 2017, but nobody wanted to listen. He said, we can destroy Texas or France with this weapon I'm showing here. So he had already those thoughts. And I think that now, they understood that's the right moment because they saw the American administration as weak, so at least as weaker than before. So they thought that's the right moment to do it. And I think they are fighting also in a geopolitical way to avoid other countries in Eastern Europe to join the Western Bloc. I believe Ukraine could really uh, join the European Union. Uh, I think it will happen. There is a long bureaucratic process, but they will do it. And what they are doing now, Russia, is trying to avoid, to, to conquer the south of Ukraine, including Odessa, and avoiding any, any contact or any a, a sea border for Ukraine. They want to control the Black Sea and, and to be there as, as Russia. But then there are other countries in the area that feel threatened by Russia. So I think it is a very, very delicate moment in the world geopolitics. I'm sure it will have some implications also in the Middle East. But again, also in this story, we are only in the beginning. Would you recommend, so many Israeli, you know, our former prime minister, Naftali Bennett, former as in resigned last week, um, he, it seemed like he wanted to jump into the fray. He flew, you know, shortly after the, the Ukrainian-Russian war broke out, he flew and he met with Putin and, you know, said, well, maybe Israel can help in some way, broker some kind of ceasefire between the parties and everything. Was, was, was that um, a, a mistake, in your opinion? Do you think Israel should take a much more neutral position and, and uh, you know, let, let the, the superpowers uh, uh, deal with their own issues? Look, in a way, Israel became almost a superpower, yeah. at least regionally. Really an economic superpower. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we have uh, a per capita income higher than Japan, than France, right. than Italy, than Spain. So and we, Russia's economy is smaller than Italy's. <laughs> exactly. So, so in a way, Israel is important. I don't think it was a mistake, but he, Bennett had two problems. One, the first priority for Israel is the Jewish community. And in Russia, we have still 150,000 Jews. By the way, they are suffering. Uh, Putin is threatening not to allow the Jewish agency to act in Russia, like in the USSR period, because most of the Israeli public opinion supports Ukraine. So there is a problem here. Even Yair Lapid, the new prime minister, he had some very important, very significant declarations on that uh, uh, sense, supporting Ukraine. So the Russians are cross with Lapid and with Israel at this stage. But for Israel, the main priority is the Jewish community. And we know that the chief rabbi uh, was fired, really, by Putin because he refused to support their policy uh, towards Ukraine and their attack in Ukraine. So we know that people in the city council of Moscow were, went to jail for seven years because they criticized their policy. So I think there are pockets, resistance pockets inside Russia that he's trying to repress Putin. And we as Israel, we must be very careful. And I think the m biggest priority is the Jewish community. Yeah. 
Well said. I think uh, there's no question this is an excellent time for any Jews who are left in Russia and Ukraine to immigrate to Israel. By the way, some are coming. Yes, I know. <laughs> Many are coming. But yes. even if they don't publish the, the figures, and most of them are in Natsrat Elit, Nofa Galil, they concentrate them there. I think they are going to make a revolution there, both Ukrainians and Russians in the same place. <laughs> very, very interesting. Yeah. Very, very, very interesting. So this is a good time for, for them to come. Absolutely. And also, uh, coming back to our main points, an excellent time for anybody, business people around the world, uh, to invest in this budding and growing relationship. It was more than budding, as, as Enrique said, it's been going on for over a decade, but right now is the time to jump in and, and invest in these projects, uh, these Israeli, Arab-led projects in the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, Saudi Arabia. Extremely exciting, and uh, yeah. You asked me before, and I didn't answer what are the main fields. Well, the first and that I see everywhere is agriculture and water. Because after COVID, these countries decided that they need to be autosufficient with, with food. Right. Because they import 90-95% of the food, so they want to produce it themselves. And Israel has the expertise on desert agriculture. Yes. So many Israeli companies are helping. I know there is a very big city, food tech city, that it's being created in Saudi Arabia between Mecca and Medina. And I'm sure there will be incredible investments, three and a half billion dollars are going to be invested there. So many companies will join this project. Second, healthcare. I think healthcare is vital. I, I can see now, and I'm involved personally, in a program everywhere in the Gulf, they have the highest rate of diabetes and children obesity in the world. Uh, I think half of the men after 50 have diabetes. Wow. So there is a real problem. And in Israel, we have the best doctors on diabetes. There is a professor, Itamar Raz, who did a huge project here, five years project, which was a big success, trying to reduce diabetes. So we are trying to bring it to the Gulf. Yes. And we have already many, many uh, agreements with them. And that's Kalev, the best diplomacy you can ever have, is trying to treat people uh, medically. I mean, bringing physicians, they are the best Absolutely. diplomats. Bring, they bring, open the hearts. Health. Literally. Medical treatment, food technology. tech, desert tech, water tech. Technology, to our, to our Arab all neighbors. the technologies. Yeah. We love to talk about you know, uh, business, uh, businesses that are tackling crises facing humanity in a commercially viable way. This is you know, what we focus on in Arise, and what a beautiful story. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think we are living really interesting times. Yeah, and I think it's even going to get better. I, let's hope <laughs> that we don't make mistakes in the way, but we must be very careful. But I think we are going to have some good news a good in the next years. Yeah, yeah. For Thank sure. You. Thank, Thank you, you so very much for much being with us today. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Yeah. There are many small businesses in Israel that are creating amazing products that never make it to the shelves of the stores where you shop. Unfortunately, there's an insidious campaign growing around the world calling to boycott Israel. And this, these small business owners see their potential market shrinking from day to day. What can we do about this? So Arise exists to make meaningful connections between friends like you in the international community and the economy of Israel. When you sign up to become a member of the Arise Alliance, we will send you on a quarterly basis a gift box filled with cosmetic products, culinary products, fashion products, amazing stuff made in Israel. Your family is going to love this. Your favorite time every quarter is going to be to stand around and discover what did you receive this quarter from Israel. And it's just a great way to weave Israeli products and the reality of Israel into your everyday life. Make sure you become a member today and help support small businesses and create jobs in Israel. Thank you.